Okay, so as Enzo, Enzo mentioned before, um, we found out uh, about a month ago that we were hosting pretty much the same program on the same evening as the Junior uh, Criminal Lawyers Association. So we thought, what better way to uh, solve the problem than to join forces? And uh, we're very happy to be including them tonight in this program. And we just want to thank them for their participation, especially uh, Junior Counsel uh, Gina Nardella and Jacob Jessen. And uh, Gina... <laughs> Gina is going to introduce our uh, next speaker, Michael Callahan. So please welcome Gina Nardella. Good evening. Before I introduce Mike, I'd just like to take a moment to thank Holly and Paul Cooper for um, joining forces with us. It's been great working with them, and we're happy to be here tonight. As some of you will know, uh, Mike Callahan is the head crown at College Park. And as you'll probably also know, College Park is quite a busy courthouse. Mike is certainly no exception and can often be found right in the thick of things. But it seems that no matter how he is, uh, how busy he is, he will always find time for you, uh, especially if you have a matter that you need to run by him, and in particular where it comes to your clients that have mental health issues. It's my pleasure to introduce Mike Callahan. I was warned uh, by my boss before I came that I had to behave in any comments I might say. Um, the handout that was prepared is consistent with the Crown policy. Now some things I may say may not be entirely consistent with established Crown policy, but they would be my own points of view and so I don't get fired I have to say that. Um, <laughs> I've directed the comments more towards defense counsel to give sort of suggestions and assistance and how to approach some of the issues when you're dealing with Crown counsel. Um, part of it will be a bit Toronto-centric. I recognize many of the people here, so that won't be a problem. Hello to Kappa's Casing if you're watching. But um, a number of years ago, the Ministry of the Attorney General recognized the issue of uh, the overpopulation of mentally ill people in the criminal justice system. Um, as you know, for a whole host of reasons, mentally ill people uh, uh, are in higher percentage of grinding poverty, uh, substance abuse, um, and as a result of that, um, often are disenfranchised from their families, uh, living in shelters, often in the, in the inner city cores. Um, often as a result of their mental illness, they become involved in the criminal justice system. And once they're involved, they're less likely to be able to get bail. Um, they don't have a surety, often. Um, they've burnt every bridge with bail program, so that's not an option. So what do you do? Um, and I think from the, from the Crown's perspective, the recommendation um, were, were, any of the, were any of these issues, where you have a mentally ill person coming before the court with charges, is to satisfy yourself that you don't have fitness concerns. Um, often, as a Crown, I'll turn to the defense and say, have you done the Taylor test? Uh, can you get instructions from your client? If counsel's able to get instructions if they've done the Taylor test, absent anything really bizarre in court, um, I'll be generally satisfied and we can move forward to talk about the issue of bail. Now obviously the Crown has to look at the, the um, um, all of the factors outlined in the criminal code, the primary, secondary, tertiary grounds, and protection of the public has to be paramount. But there's a lot of people who are being held in custody simply because uh, they're mentally ill or because of factors linked to their mental illness. And, and I, I think you're going to find that you have Crowns as well as others and defense counsel in the community who think that's simply not right. Uh, and so what we tried to do is work with the mental health court workers that are in the building to try to come up with some creative ways that would satisfy uh, the, the Crowns, our, from our perspective, the secondary ground concerns and uh, protection of the public. But at the same time, find a way to release people who should be in the community, generally in the civil mental health system. So my recommendation generally is for defense counsel to come with as much information as they, ha as they can in terms of the person's um, mental health uh, diagnosis, if they have one, any contacts they have in the community. Sometimes they already have community uh, workers. Sometimes they have support teams. Uh, and if the defense 
can find out that information and can even get a hold of any of those people um, or incorporate that into a proposal to bring to the Crown, it's a lot easier for the Crown to, to be able to consent to a release. Often on the day of, in the morning, in the rush, when people are late from Vanier or they're late from every other place, it's difficult to come to put together a comprehensive plan, uh, something that would satisfy the Crown's uh, secondary ground concerns. I'll be frank, from my perspective, primary ground concerns on many of the charges that come before the court are not, are not my biggest concern. Uh, I'm more interested in protection of the public. We have another fail to appear court on a mentally ill person um, who has a record with 8 million fail to appear courts. That's not causing me concern in terms of the protection of the public. But I need to know that they have a place to go, uh, a place to live, somebody who's going to be checking up on them, and hopefully some willingness on their part to work with other community agencies. Um, that's often a difficult part. Often people who are ill uh, are, have a lot of paranoid delusions um, and are vigorously opposed to cooperating with anybody. So that is often impediment to, to a release. But if you speak to your clients beforehand, spend some time with them, explain why it's in their interest to be agreeable to certain terms, um, I think that you're much more likely to have a, a favorable result. Now, I'm realistic. I know that uh, Legal Aid Ontario uh, does not pay you for the time that is really required um, for a lot of these cases. I know that um, dealing with mentally disordered people is time consuming, um, but often putting in that time is really required to have the rapport or to get the plan in place that's going to lead to a positive result from their perspective, released into the community and not in custody. Um, you know, uh, although I think the ministry's official position is we have all the resources we need, um, some people would differ uh, with that analysis. Uh, and, and often, you know, the crowns don't have time to sit down and speak with you in a way that would be required to actually go over what the key concerns are and sort of what could satisfy the crown for a consent release at the end of the day. Um, what I would suggest as a starting point, when you don't know what to do, you get a call, um, or uh, certainly the duty council at College Park are well aware, we have a very high percentage of mentally ill people who come into College Park courts, uh, is to go to the mental health court workers. The mental health court workers act as gatekeepers to a lot of community resources. Um, so if they can't help, they generally will know someone who might be able to help. They might be able to help in getting accommodation. Um, uh, uh, there's emergency uh, beds that can be made available on occasion. Obviously they're very limited, as well as um, contacts to shelters so that when people leave the courthouse, they have people who are waiting for them who are going to be able to assist them. On occasion, people will be able to walk them from the courthouse to uh, a specific shelter. Um, so it's really important that you connect with those people because ultimately, uh, as defense counsel, your goal may be also to get them released, but also to think to mental health diversion down the road if that's something that uh, might fit the facts and fit your client's uh, desires at the end of the day. So in relation to um, release planning, um, what I would really suggest is that you focus on any kind of supervision in the community. Um, and if, you, if you've got information about any resources that are already in place, if you've, if you've been able to establish any kind of a uh, place where they're going to reside upon release and any kind of supervision, even if it's through a, an appointment with a psychiatrist or if it's whether it's a community support worker, all of that's going to assist the Crown in saying, I'm going to take a chance on this person. Because at the end of the day, we don't want someone out in the community when they're ill and uh, they've, got, they've got nowhere to go, they have no supports, and they end up hurting someone. Um, that, that's the worst case scenario from the Crown's perspective. So, you know, we want to be able to uh, assure ourselves that the secondary grounds uh, are, are, um, are adequately addressed. Now, at the end of the day, it doesn't have to be consent release. Obviously, all of that work you're doing uh, is going to be helpful so that if it is a contested hearing, um, you're going to say, look, it's not as though there's nothing out there. We've done the following, and you can outline it. I also think you should be go back to the bail program. Sometimes if the bail program's aware of the major mental illness, um, they, they will take a second look at someone. Um, there's also the, the, mental, uh, the mental illness uh, um, bail program worker um, who can um, be directed to address um, specific individuals. Sometimes it takes a little bit of 
uh, negotiation to get the bail program to reconsider and to to um, to take on clients. But certainly that really helps the Crown in terms of um, being able to look at a consent release because of the support that's in the community. Once the issue of bail has been addressed, uh, and unfortunately there's many occasions when the Crown simply can't consent to a release. There's simply uh, the criminal record, uh, secondary ground concerns, people who have no insight into their illness, who are uh, erratic and with uh, perhaps saying uh, threats in the courtroom or the nature of their conduct is violent. Um, there are people who simply, from the Crown's perspective, have to be held in custody because of public safety concerns. I mean, those are individuals where, um, as defense counsel, I think you're going to want to move quickly to, and put concerted pressure on the Crown to get the disclosure and uh, so that you can assess your case and what strategy you're going to do as you move forward. Um, a certain number of those cases um, and those charges are going to be diverted. Um, the ministry realized that the number of mentally ill people who were in jail for really minor offenses was disproportionate um, because they didn't have anyone out there, because often they didn't have appropriate representation in the past, uh, and, and when they were ill they just wanted to plead guilty. They just did the cycle in jail again and again and again without really addressing the root cause of their uh, continued involvement in the justice system, which was their mental illness. Um, so a number of uh, diversion programs were set up. I should put it, they weren't really set up, they were permitted. So the, the policy was permissive and it directed that each of the regions should establish mental health diversions in their courthouses. Criteria were set out. Some defense counsel and others would suggest they are very restrictive criteria in terms of what could be considered for mental health diversion. But it was a good start and that's when you had um, already starting up was 102 court, uh, sort of that was a pilot that went before the Crown uh, policy uh, officially permitted it. Um, but with the advent of the changes to the Crown policy manual, it, it made a requirement for different regions and different Crown's offices to look at this issue and to develop um, plans for their courthouses and, and, to, and how they were going to interpret mental health diversion. Um, the ministry signed contracts with local service providers, uh, mental health court workers to uh, administer the mental health um, diversions in each of the courthouses. I know in the Toronto region, all of the courthouses, co courthouses have mental health court workers from various agencies. I know that in the GTA, all of the courthouses have varying degree of mental health diversion. Kitchener, London, Ottawa, um, Sudbury. I know a lot of the, um, the at least mid-sized communities as well have mental health diversion. 